you take a look um, at the, the perspective of uh, education and uh, digitalization, it's always a question of uh, if you address the few or the many. And uh, yesterday, for those that were here in the session uh, uh, at 12.15, uh, we had a very nice presentation of uh, the Austrian solution related to this sort of big question. And when I'm talking about the Austrian solution, this is really the Austrian solution. Huh? So it's not a part of it with a small network trying to do something, but uh, structures that have been established over the years some things work out better than others, but uh, reaching from uh, actually primary level to upper secondary level of all schools. We do have corporations with universities as well, but still focused uh, on the school system and all the way um, to the Federal Ministry of Education, uh, which means that we are now uh, at a situation where we have the connection to both uh, teachers that use digital aspects in everyday classroom work, as well as getting funding for the development and um, maintenance of uh, our very central platform, which has the name Individual AT, which means that actually everything we are talking about today in my presentation relates on one behalf on this network structure, but it comes down to, and I can give you the executive summary right away, uh, big, big, big Moodle installations uh, that are hosted centrally by the Federal Ministry of Education uh, that are available to everyone. And the part uh, I'm in charge of uh, started uh, 2016 and has the name eEducation. And eEducation is a uh, network of schools that um, have the emphasis on digitalization in general. We started out 2016 with 300 schools. By now we have around 4,000 schools that participate in this network. And um, taking the size of Austria into account, we have a total of 6,000 schools. Um, it's quite a big number that we can uh, reach with the idea of digitalization and all aspects that uh, relate to this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this network, uh, but first I also think that you will not be uh, able to read everything, but I can give you uh, the main top-down impression. Uh, the Federal Ministry of Education uh, has established work groups that address different uh, levels uh, within the school system. Uh, one is that uh, the way the school system works is we have uh, local uh, educational authorities uh, in each state and uh, these uh, local authorities are actually in uh, charge of state schools. Uh, in addition, uh, we have uh, th the idea that these um, local authorities and these states, we have nine states in Austria, uh, are in charge of primary and sec lower secondary education. And uh, we have other school types. One is uh, academic school. The other school types are related to upper secondary education. That's where the federal ministry is in charge of. And so, uh, for example, just taking a consideration of how uh, the problems sometimes are in Germany, where they have uh, 16 states, and uh, they're so much bigger, uh, for them it's a little more difficult uh, to find a central strategy. But Austria being so small, this is still possible. So even uh, if we have this federalistic case of uh, different uh, um, obligations that the states have, uh, related to schools as well as uh, the federal ministry, we sort of all work together. And uh, for example, one practical example is our centralized uh, Moodle platform, which means that uh, vocational schools, primary schools, uh, um, lower and upper secondary schools, and all the way to universities can access in the, same, uh, si the same system. So in addition to uh, that, we have one thing which is maybe a little uh, untypical or typical to Austria, let's say that, uh, is that we have also nine universities of education. And these nine universities of education, also one being in each state, we have a few more, we have some private uh, uh, universities as well. They're actually in, in charge of either basic or uh, uh, further teacher education. 
And then we also have the uh, virtual University of Education, which has done uh, the digital again agenda over the past years, where they tried to promote uh, e-learning related things, digitalization in general. But uh, still, uh, this whole network, um, this is uh, the structure in Austria and e-education, this teacher network uh, relates to all these fields, which means that we have actually uh, um, a great uh, number of persons that work. You see here in the lower right hand corner that there are 60 state coordinators, which means that uh, they're actually provisioned uh, from uh, the federal ministry with uh, sort of money or hours that they get for their support of schools. And that starts, uh, we have uh, with primary schools up to uh, upper secondary schools and depending on the size of each state, uh, there's a different number of state coordinators. But we then coordinate them um, uh, with a team, a core team of about additional 15 persons. So it's a total of about 80 persons that uh, try to, uh, to improve digitalization in general for schools throughout Austria. Um, we got the new numbers just recently uh, because I was talking about uh, two-thirds uh, of schools participating in this network. Actually, it's 78% of all teachers and uh, students in Austrian schools um, that of work in e-education schools belonging to this network. What we do is we have two big conferences uh, with around 300 uh, uh, persons per year. Uh, one is in March, one is in November. And we also try to emphasize on using uh, didactical tools, digital tools and classroom situations, reflect upon them and try to sort of uh, take the best out of this. And uh, it's a very good way of uh, connecting all those people that are in engaged just in this particular part of digitalization uh, and exchange uh, their thoughts on that. The last conference we had, of course, was uh, related to AI. But let me give you this uh, uh, idea of the principles of this network. And actually, this is uh, our sort of solution we found that we need to tackle. Uh, we have this like a uh, pillar concept, uh, these different um, perspectives within each organization. So the first uh, column would be digital competences, which means uh, at first all the people that uh, want to uh, use any software in classroom situations for teaching, they have to have a certain basic fundament of uh, digital competences. So we try to emphasize our uh, educational programs on establishing this. So first step is try to get the teachers to become more digital in general. This then means, and then we're moving to the second pillar, that uh, we can address the question of uh, how does this transfer to classroom situations? How are the tools being used? Which tools are being used? This is where Moodle kicks in, for example. But still, our perspective is uh, not to uh, look towards specific situations in schools, but in general, to enable. And this means that we have to uh, have a broader perspective towards the whole idea. Uh, you know probably that uh, Moodle, of course, uh, is a very big system, but sometimes it can become overwhelming for an individual. So that's where we focus on. We have apps, for example, that focus just on the reduction <laughs> in the front end of Moodle. So the first steps are easy, even in the classroom situations. And then the third uh, pillar, which is actually a very important one, that's uh, the organizational development. How does the organization you teach in uh, provide services to you as a teacher to be able to do this? And uh, this is a big perspective because uh, of course there's, uh, the, the, there are the aspects of infrastructure, for example, but still what's, uh, what's the main idea? What uh, um, are the perspectives of the organization related to learning? What's the philosophy? How much free freedom does a teacher have in maybe transporting certain ideas of a curricula? And um, we have uh, enabled a set of tools where, uh, where schools can relate to that, self-assess, 
and then see which uh, are the necessary next steps to take. So they will be able to develop something like a digitalization concept and then based upon this uh, develop uh, the needs uh, of further education that is needed for uh, their staff. To uh, provide you with some numbers and this is also a key point um, uh, of our basic idea of e-education is uh, that we have this sort of gamification idea. And actually it has worked out pretty well uh, since 2016. And the, um, the gamification idea is the following. We have a concept of three levels. We have so-called member schools, expert schools, and expert plus schools. So um, if, a, if a school decides to uh, become member of our network, of the e-education uh, network, which is totally free of charge because it is a, a, a project run by the Federal Ministry of Education, uh, they just have to fill uh, in an online form. And that was it. So then they're a mem member uh, of this network. And this just means uh, giving the message, yes, we want to uh, try to go on the digital, digital path. And then um, our gamification idea kicks in. You see this uh, different types of badge categories uh, uh, up there. And these are badges that are actually not given to a person, but to an organization. So a school working on different uh, digital ideas, uh, they uh, document what they're doing and earn points by doing this. And this is where the network of our 60 state coordinators kicks in because uh, they reflect, give feedback, acknowledge, say yes, this is okay, or this is not okay. And uh, or they, so they can even decline activities that schools turned in if it's not too much pedagogy or digitalization involved. And uh, by this, at a certain stage, uh, the schools become expert schools. And from this moment on, they're able to access the centralized budgets, which is a sort of a neat idea. We have a, a budget of uh, half a million euros per year that we can use for further teacher, teacher education. And once you have this expert status uh, and you have uh, acquired it during a school year, it, uh, you have it uh, kept for the next year as well. And then if you would stop documenting, you would drop down to member status again. So we have uh, a shift between member schools and expert schools all the time. Um, the Expert Plus schools, those are the ones that are the highlights. They have a digitalization concept. They have a very big focus on digitalization. Uh, often they contribute teachers to uh, our further educational programs because they uh, tell about technologies. And um, as I mentioned before, if you want to broaden uh, the perspective, then of course, uh, it's not only open source. We have other players. We have Google, we have Microsoft, and we want to provide them with easy entry points in the frameworks that they are using. However, keeping in mind that there is a very much more useful system in the background called Moodle. And, um, so we let them work in their context, but then open it up uh, from step to step. And this is where at any time, any teacher can switch over from one product, so to speak, uh, to the other. The other things that we have also is, um, of course, e-learning scenarios. I will come to that a little further down the road. And those proposed activities, that, these are actually the activities that the schools document. So by now we have almost 100,000 activities that have been documented in the past years uh, in, uh, uh, related to different uh, fields. Uh, in our um, badge system. And so that's actually our, the measure of all things. You come from member to expert schools and what our state coordinators have is uh, actually a, a statistical dashboard that shows what are the expert schools in my state, where is development needed and they try to support these schools uh, on this uh, agenda. As I mentioned, uh, we have this self-assessment tool in place for schools so they can get a basic idea what digital competences means in general. And we heard it yesterday, there are EU frameworks like DigComp, DigComp Edu or DigComp Org that we use uh, as base of the self-assessment. So everyone knows about digitalization in general. If a school logs in, um, 
what they can see is uh, the different tools that are provided for them uh, for this reflection part, for creating digitalization concepts, um, but also to uh, document the activities. Or at the very bottom, you would see the individual registration, which means if a school then just clicks this button, automatically a, a, a course area is created for the school, as was presented yesterday, where uh, schools then immediately have access to our big Moodle installation. It's just like one click. So so first to become a member with the education and then they're all automatically sent to this other system as well. Here's a perspective or a view of the statistics that are produced and depending on the role system uh, and the role you have in the system, um, you get different uh, forms of aggregation uh, of these statistics, but this is then base of your work uh, to see where uh, improvements can be done. And now just to give you an idea of uh, what kind of activities uh, there exist, we have our main uh, batch categories, but within these categories, we have these activities, like using a learning management system school-wide. That gives you 10 points uh, that you can have if you prove that you have this in place or that you use it. And um, depending on the school size, you then get a, a point uh, limit you have to reach. And after you have reached this, then you come to this uh, expert status. And so at any time, you can even uh, then download a certificate, which shows you, OK, now I have become expert school. And this is also a little bit of a marketing instrument uh, for schools to show that uh, you know, they're on their technical way. Another thing that we have in place, which is uh, kind of neat, uh, is uh, actually um, that we have all our curricula from all subjects, from primary to upper secondary, in one system, um, uh, with, which is competency-based. Um, I will show it to you right away. It's actually a software. It's called Comet. It's like competence uh, grid editing tool, which enables you to develop competence grids. And that's uh, very important to understand what the difference is between competences and competence grids, because uh, competence grids also introduce a level of complexity. Uh, like taking uh, uh, the presentation from yesterday with uh, language skills, you start with A1 to C2. Uh, you can have this applied to virtually any subject. And uh, by doing this, we put uh, uh, learning objects to these competence fields for teachers to use. And so they know in classroom situations immediately, uh, OK, I can actually select uh, what is my subject, at which level do I want to teach, and have this material accessible right away. For example, for digitalization, we have about 500 examples just related to digitalization in different subjects uh, called DigiComp. And uh, they're freely available, and they're all Moodle courses. Like one learning object is equals out to one Moodle course. Of course, keeping in mind that not everyone is using uh, Moodle, it is open to that degree that we cannot use uh, Moodle activities within this openness unless you log in. Yeah? But still, uh, we have the metadata provided and the learning objects. And uh, actually, the way it works is then the description of the competence and uh, then the examples, the learning objects are directly related to this and can be called up. And uh, then you see already here, if you click on one of those links, you're in a Moodle course, which is uh, openly available. The Moodle installation is configured this way that it's open uh, for everyone. And um, we call this concept Itapas. And actually, the founder of this idea is Robert and me many years ago, because we both love tapas. And uh, the idea of having a didactical scenario, it's not so much about the content, but it's more about telling a teacher on how to use this content in a specific context uh, in his classroom work. Uh, so this is, uh, has certain restrictions. It has to be OER. Uh, it has to be uh, something that can be done within one hour of teaching. So maybe even a, a teacher that uh, kicks in for a different teacher that's turned sick could go on this website and immediately tell the teachers, uh, the students, go ahead and uh, work on this example, and then would also get the solution. If uh, the teacher works with Moodle, 
all Moodle possibilities kick in. If a teacher works with a different platform, we even have onboarding from Teams to Moodle. So if a, uh, someone uses Microsoft and uses Microsoft Teams, they would have an app that transports all these uh, etapas into the Microsoft course. And actually uh, hidden behind that, there's a transfer of all the students that are synchronized from uh, uh, Microsoft Teams to our central Moodle installation. And the data is stored uh, in Moodle. Huh? And uh, it works perfectly. And you know, the teacher doesn't care where the data is saved. They just want to onboard in their system that they're used to work with. Uh, the big idea, of course, is Teams is not a learning management system. It's uh, something that you can onboard or you have a communication uh, a possibility, but there's more. And uh, what Robert showed yesterday was actually uh, now the very big idea, which is called Bildungsportal. And this is uh, this very central mechanism. It's uh, one big portal, which is one big Moodle installation that connects all e-government applications uh, to uh, the educational context. So um, you see these different platforms. The first one is e-education. That's my, or our, that's our teacher network that we support. Um, they can log in uh, and have uh, all the data that is from the single sign mechanism uh, available within uh, that platform, which relates to school development and digital competences. Individual being the Moodle installation uh, for technology savvy teachers uh, automatically has all the accounts uh, made available. Uh, Edutech, that's uh, the next uh, project that we're just tackling. Is this going to be where the content is? Guess what it's based on. Uh, it will be a Moodle repository function uh, to transport all the data to all different platforms and all the content that is related uh, to this uh, being used in school. We have an edtech integration. So uh, edtech companies can also apply to uh, become part of this Bildungsportal and then uh, there are different levels of integration of their software and so they can be in, become part um, of, of this system in general. And then we have PH Online, that's uh, the further education qualification platform used by the universities of education uh, where also teachers log in and, and have all these resources available. And so now uh, Saying this, we have actually now four Moodles in plan working together. We have the government uh, Moodle, uh, where all teachers, students, and parents um, can log in. I talked to Martin a couple of days ago, and I said, hey, we're heading towards the biggest Moodle installation worldwide. He said, be careful. Uh, in China, they have at an open university, they have 3.5 million. I said, we're going towards 3 million. but." Of course, it's about numbers and don't take it too seriously. We can put it into a different context uh, related to uh, all the people that live uh, in Austria, the population, it's 9 million. Uh, we can reach with this first platform one third of the whole population. Coming down to open university would be 0 0.002 for 1.4 billion <laughs> Chinese. <laughs> no, but it's just about numbers. <laughs> Uh, then, of course, individual, as we mentioned yesterday, that's the platform uh, that we use for didactics, uh, uh, mostly. Uh, then Moodle as material repository, I just mentioned that. And uh, now we also have this idea, it's called, it's, the name is not going to be individual light, but the idea is that if you have a teacher that you want to onboard uh, and you have everything done in the background, you automatically create courses and so on. Uh, this could be a Moodle installation where this is kept. Huh? So it's, it's lightweight and easy to access for everyone and nobody knows right away that they're working with Moodle. So uh, Moodle will do this subversively one step after the other. <laughs> That's a basic idea. But so just to give you the number, uh, it's, it's, it's a big thing. Huh? And uh, actually the talks that um, uh, we had in the past uh, few days uh, was uh, especially uh, from uh, Sandra, Julia, and also Robert with other installations that have a similar size uh, and issues that we have related to that. So uh, it was very good that we are present here. It was perfect. Um, and uh, that's just a new phase of uh, the individual platform that uh, we just updated to a 4.2 version. 
And uh, now taking this uh, graphic into consideration, um, I just want to point out uh, some points. So moving from the left side uh, of e-education, where we emphasize on transporting and dis disseminating all this knowledge to teachers, um, we have all the learning objects which are available on the site, but they're connected with this Comet tool. Uh, so they have a specific pedagogical context uh, to uh, curricula to each uh, subject. Uh, and we have this synchronized with Edutek, which is this material repository and uh, synchronized uh, with uh, the individual platform. For those that might know uh, the Xavis series, um, that's a product series that we initiated many years ago. It's a portfolio work and competency-based education as, as plugins for Moodle. We use them to get the data into Moodle, to get the learning objects into Moodle. And as you see uh, down here, it does not matter to us if it's even MS Teams that you start with, you connect to this whole complex. And all these interfaces have been um, automized so far. Uh, and there are two apps uh, that we have devel developed uh, together with Germany, uh, Baden-Württemberg, uh, state of Baden-Württemberg in the past few years, where they concentrate on using uh, competence grids uh, to develop individualized learning paths. The main idea would be um, first take a test uh, as a student and then you find the position in a competence grid uh, depending on the level uh, of your knowledge. And then once you have this position defined in this competence grid, the system then shows you what are the next steps to take to reach your goal. And that's what the project is about. Uh, the Comet tool actually is something which is outside of uh, Moodle. It's also based on open source. Uh, it's a content management system called Typo3. Uh, open source, a big uh, CMS uh, around Europe, uh, enterprise based. And we do the creation of the competence grids there. So many can participate. And this is platform independent. But then this is synchronized to Moodle. And even from our block, we have a, a script that then synchronizes this to the Moodle competences, uh, back and forth. So it's pretty much working well on this behalf. Actually, the very bottom two apps, this is where pedagogy <laughs> or didactics kick in, because this is when you have to think about uh, how can you be supportive to a learner using digital technology. Uh, three more minutes to go. And um, I think that's time for the questions. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Buildings portal is based on Moodle.net somehow? Or? On Moodle. Just Moodle. Core, it's, it's hosted centrally uh, at a server at the Federal Ministry of Education. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Martin. Uh, oh my god. That's <laughs> uh, no, not, it's not technical. Um, what's, the, what's the support? from the government of like uh, for this like and and teachers and and uh, associations of teachers and so on i mean uh, is it is there a general good feeling politically yes and uh, we have a very big advantage uh, for example robert he was the one that initiated individual centrally i took his job over when everything was almost finished uh, and he moved to the federal ministry of education so now we are we have this uh, starting with funding uh, all the way to classroom work uh, and of course uh, you know to be realistic uh, we still or our government still pays uh, licensing licensing fees to microsoft but in addition, they have a budget for open source development, and which is great. And uh, giving uh, half a million uh, euros per year for further teacher education, that's fine as well. 
And then in addition, we have the, those state coordinators that get money for their work. And for the ETAP, as I forgot to mention, those uh, OER learning objects, they're also financed. So you get around 250 euros if you uh, produce one of those ETAPAs, so that's the incentive for a teacher to do this. And, and I would, I've always loved your co work around competencies for many years, that, that the modules and things you've written, uh, would love, still love to see that get into course somehow. It's a big, another big discussion. But anyway, if you haven't seen his, uh, what's, uh, what's it called again, the name? Exavis Competencies. Yes, yeah, Exavis. Uh, Check it out, it's on the plugins database. Thank you, and uh, Martin, thank you so much uh, that you participated. You know, we have a, 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 a special relationship because we both love your platform. Um, and I think I was one of the few persons in your life that cost you a sleepless night. Remember Moodle Moot Miami. Oh. That sounds a very good story for another time. Thank yeah, you very okay. much. <laughs> <laughs> Cigar. <laughs> Thank you.